Yeah. And so understand the really exciting opportunities there are for integrating services, but also know how hard it is and uh, how difficult uh, making those changes are. So um, it's great to have you all on the call today. So just a few bits of um, housekeeping for today. Um, we're very, very keen uh, that everyone uh, has a chance to contribute. This session is really about uh, sharing some of our thoughts, but mostly about hearing your thoughts and uh, hearing all of your expertise, because we think that by working together and by hearing um, lots of things into this, we will end up with a much better a uh, better situation and better product at the end. So, so thank you for that. Please do put your hand up if you want to ask any questions. Um, if you don't mind keeping on mute while you're not talking, that would be really helpful. If um, when you are asking a question or anything, just say who you are so we know where um, where you're from and, and who you are. Um, and if there's other comments that we're not covering or anything you want to, um, to say, just put it in the chat at any time because um, we will be capturing all of that and all of the information today will very much feed into our future direction of travel. So... Thank you for that. Um, and I think um, that's all I was going to say about uh, working together. But clearly, if there's any concerns or questions, please raise them anytime. So just in terms of what we're going to be covering today, um, we've got a team of people from the CQC supporting us today, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and we have, um, uh, we will ask them as they uh, come and speak to introduce themselves and to um, to explain what their role is. Um, but these, um, we've got a strong team working on this uh, going forward. It's something that's really important to us uh, to get right. And um, we will make sure that uh, we send out the names and the contact details of uh, the team in the CQC. So you will be able to contact people with further uh, follow-up thoughts and questions. Essentially, um, I'm going to be handing over to Matt in a minute, who's going to talk us through some of our early thinking. Then we're going to go into some breakout rooms um, and have a discussion about, um, uh, about what we've heard and, and really pick your brains about what we've heard. And then a little bit of feedback, although we do death by feedback um, and aim to wrap up and close by 4.30. And we very want to, much want to uh, keep to that time. So that's... Um, that's the plan. If we could go on to the next slide. <coughs> so the aim of today's events is really to update um, you all on the work and development on our approach to system oversight and insurance. Um, why do we think this is important? Well, I just want to share some thoughts for myself about why this is important. I think um, we've all, all got personal stories about uh, integration and where it works well and where it doesn't work well. I've got a son with a genetic condition and um, complex needs and have seen firsthand about how you can get great care if everything works. But sometimes when those services don't work together, you get uh, you get things falling through the gaps. And we hear lots as a regulator about where people kind of fall through the gaps between providers. Um, as a GP, also on a daily basis, I saw um, the impact of good integrated care, particularly around things like end of life care and um, and working together to make sure that people's needs are met. But you also see where people really struggle when um, services don't work together. And um, I think more than ever, as we're coming out of COVID or, or whatever the next stage of COVID is, um, <coughs> we're in a situation where integrated care is, is not just a nice thing to happen. It's going to be imperative both to meet the needs of people using services, but also to meet the, um, the challenges that we're going to have to face over the coming um, weeks and months and years. Um, and I think increasingly as a regulator, we're, um, our legislation up to now has been very much looking at providers that uh, we regulate and our legislation only looks at, at the providers, uh, allows us to look at providers. But we're increasingly hearing from um, providers that actually they can, they've done as much as they can to improve the quality of care that they're giving. And some of the quality issues that they're seeing are related to providers in their local area or the local systems or the commissioning arrangements. And so for those reasons, um, we feel this is really important um, that this is something that we look at. And we feel that 
very much want to be an enabler in this space. We want to make sure that we are in a position to um, to enable the right things to happen for people who use services across all services. So across health, social care and, um, and the independent sector and every single service that sits in a local footprint. So, um, so we're going to want to hear your views about, you know, how do we really assess quality at integrated care systems and local authority le um, levels? We want to be absolutely sure that we add value into this space and that we make sure that um, what we do drives the right things to happen. So we want to hear, um, hear about any gaps we're not thinking about particularly and what are the kind of things that we really need to consider going through the next few months. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, Matt, if you're happy for me to hand over to you and um, for, to take us through some slides and then uh, we will go from there. So over to you, Matt. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Rosie. Um, Hi everyone, uh, Matthew Tate here. I'm Head of Strategy at CQC um, and I'm leading on the policy and the sort of strategic input into this stream of work. Um, so we're leading very much on, especially in the early phases around the, the work on the legislation with the Department of Health and the the uh, scoping and the, the overall design of the, uh, the work on the ICS uh, assessments. Um, and then we'll be working uh, very much with colleagues across the organisation on the, the programme design and uh, intelligence inspection teams as we go through and, and develop the, the detail of the work that will sit underneath this. So what I'm going to be talking about um, today is, is uh, the, the early phases of the work. Um, it's the start of a conversation. It's the early, early thinking on the overall approach to ICS assessments as it stands at the moment, but obviously we're we're still a, a fair way from from actual implementation of this. So it's a chance to start the conversation and check the the sort of um, the early work that we've done so far. Um, as you might have picked up, I've I've got a bit of a, a cold at the moment, and I've I've got a, particularly I've got a, a quite a bad cough, so I may have to put myself on on mute from time to time as we go along. I'll do my best, and um, I've got someone on standby to take over if I just completely collapse um, and are unable to continue, but hopefully I'll be all right. Um, so uh, we want to put this in context of the wider work that we're doing on our new regulatory model. So the strategy that we've just published as, as an organisation um, sets out our, our plan over the coming years to um, change how we deliver uh, our work, our, our regulation of services, providers, and um, soon-to-be systems. And um, as part of that, the the work that we're sort of getting into now is the work on uh, updating our assessment framework um, in, in terms of the, which sets out the, the, the way we make judgments about the quality of care and sort of what good looks like. So I, I don't have time to kind of cover the, the the full range of our strategic ambitions. There, there's a lot in there, as you'd expect, for a, a, a big strategy covering a big, uh, sort of a long period of time. Um, broadly speaking, what we're, we're trying to do is be more, uh, I suppose you'd say, responsive and 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 more nimble in how we use evidence and and our ability to present findings more quickly. So we're able to be more flexible in our regulatory approach, update information more quickly, um, and be more transparent about how we're. Uh, coming up with that, the, the 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 detail of the judgments of of services and how we construct ratings um, underneath that. So, in terms of the assessment framework, if you're if you're familiar with our assessment framework at the moment, it's um, it, it's a it's a quite long set of ratings characteristics which go into quite a, a a length of detail in terms of what good looks like and all the all the other levels of our ratings. And sitting alongside that, there are a whole series of detailed questions, key lines of inquiry, prompt questions, um, and different frameworks for adult social care and, and health services. What we're trying to do is, is one of the first phases of our strategic work is, is really rationalise a lot of that and simplify it, make it more meaningful to, to people and more accessible. So, so distilling that down into the essentials of what good quality care looks like across the board. And then underneath that, there will be all the um, supporting detail that's relevant for, for, the, for, for the services. Um, 
the reason it's important to, to, to talk about the wider new regulatory model work is that one of the principles that we're working to is that as much as possible, which should go a long way, is that the work on our new regulatory model and all the tools, the systems, the reporting methodologies, the frameworks, wherever possible, that approach will apply it at these new levels of assessment as well. Um, we're not talking about doing something sort of wildly different um, at, at system level to provider level, although there will obviously need to be some differences um, to take account of the, the, the differences in, in approach. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is just the, the legislative context for this. As people may be aware that the Health and Care Bill is going through Parliament um, and would give CQC uh, new powers around local authority assurance, the focus on how local authorities are meeting Care Act duties, um, and also task CQC with reviewing and assessing integrated care systems. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to focus um, too much on the local authority side, um, although I will mention it. Um, the, the main focus of the discussion here is on, on the integrated care system work, but there is some, some useful context on the local authority side as well, which I'll cover briefly. Um, a number of different principles here. I'm not going to read all of these out. Um, they're, they're largely sort of set out in, in the strategy, and this is really principles that we're working to across our new regulatory model. There's a, a, quite a number of different principles here, as you can see, and, and you'd expect that because they, these principles apply in different ways to different parts of, of our work. So some of them are about how we use information, being more uh, proportionate, flexible. Some of them are specifically about the things we look at um, in our assessment frameworks and how we come up with judgments and, and changes in emphasis or strengthening um, things that we already do currently. So um, so there's a lot uh, there's a lot there, but, but all of that translates again to the uh, provider level. Um, single assessment framework. So, again, if you're familiar with our with our current framework, there are five key questions in the fr in, in in the framework, and, and this um, th those will continue to be relevant. At are these are these slides? People can see the slides, right? Yeah. Um, yep. So, there are five key questions which apply at provider level, um, and Currently underneath the, the key questions, as I mentioned, characteristics, key lines of inquiry, prompt uh, prompt questions, a lot of detail. What we're trying to do is, as I say, simplify that down to a set of quality statements, um, which will apply across the board and, and uh, sort of distill everything to, to a more accessible way. Underneath that, as we do now, we'll collect evidence um, with specific indicators. Um, what we're trying to do is be, be clearer, more consistent, more concise in particular about how we present evidence and make, again, that information more accessible um, than, it, than it currently is. If, if you're familiar with CQC reports at the moment, they're often quite long narrative. It depends on the sector and the service, but they can be very long, dense narrative reports. We're, we're trying to make them more accessible, and that will also improve the consistency of how we how we present information externally and the transparency of our judgments. Um, so that's the provider level. A lot of this will um, still apply, will also apply at the ICS and local authority level, we believe, but we need to work through that. And I'll talk a bit about some of the issues that we're looking at. Um, next slide, please. So what all that means for system oversight? Um, so a few sort of key things we're thinking about as we do this work. Um, one is about making sure that we hold um, this is really about making sure the assessments are tailored to the the, the different level and, and uh, the system level and recognize the differences between um, ICSs, local authorities and, and uh, providers that deliver services. So what, what we're trying to do here in this phase of the work is be absolutely clear about the scope of the assessment. What are we trying to, to assess ICSs for? What's their core purpose? What are they accountable for? And therefore, what how does that play out in our um, in our assessment approach? Equally, uh, it's the same with local authorities, um, and, and again, reference to the specific uh, care act duties. Uh, next slide. So, in terms of the care act, um, again, the, the, this is the context for the local authority work. Um, there, there's a bit there, as you can see, it, it, it's about reform of the adult social care and support legislation. Um, with a focus on uh, ensuring individuals have control of day-to-day -day lives, suitability of living accommodation, contributions to society, um, and some requirements of local authorities around considering each person's beliefs, wishes, um, feelings. Uh, next slide. And what this means in terms of the pr proposed approach for local authority assurance, 
and a lot of this will be true of um, integrated care system assessment as well. What we'll need to do is establish a baseline of, of quality and safety. So this is the first time we will have um, looked at this level. Um, we, we've, we have previously carried out local system reviews, but this is a different type of assessment. And we, so we need to establish a, a baseline of what uh, quality and safety looks like. Th that then will lead, lead into a sort of ongoing approach of assessment of quality and risk, which um, evidence gathering will be tailored around um, what we know about the the different levels, the, the services, the the, the um, system levels. Um, again, we'll be uh, capturing good good practice and encouraging improvement. That's an important focus. It's really clear in our strategy that what we're trying to do is 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 really uh, improve the way we we capture good practice and and, and use our different regulatory levers, if you like, to um, encourage improvement in services. Um, and again, obviously making use of all relevant data sources. What that particular means, and this is again true of provider regulation and, and system level, is, is only using the, the, the site visits, the, the physical inspection, if you like, um, where it's the best use of, of, of gathering evidence. That's something we talk a lot about in the, in the um, in the strategy and it would apply here as well. It's about what, what is the right tool for gathering information rather than a, a sort of constant reliance just on inspection to gather, gather evidence. It's about being more flexible and responsive and proportionate um, to, the, to the situation. Next slide. So in terms of integrated care systems, this is uh, just a bit of context about the core purpose of integrated care systems. Um, and there's more detail underneath this in, in the guidance for them, but They've got a range of functions around improving population health and healthcare, tackling unequal access, experience and outcomes, enhancing productivity and value for money, and supporting uh, broader social and economic development. And within all of that, and sitting across all of that, obviously a real focus on integration of services and collaboration across the ICS geographies. So we need to be taking account of all of that and constructing an approach to assessing integrated care systems in terms of lo looking at that's what we will hold them to account for broadly speaking. So next slide. Um, in terms of our assessment approach, we're sort of looking at, at, at the moment, uh, this is obviously early thinking um, in many respects, but th what we're looking at is, is grouping if you like, or uh, the the content of, of, of an assessment framework or the things that we'd look at into three broad categories. One around the, the leadership functions of the ICS bodies, all of the different parts of the ICS around um, uh, leadership uh, and, and the sort of uh, strategic aspects of the, those roles um, as assessing the needs of, of uh, their populations, all of that sort of leadership uh, side, of, side of things. Um, the actual function of integration, collaboration within the ICS, how well that is, is working within each, each ICS geography and, and how well the different system bodies are uh, promoting that and, and supporting it. And then the actual quality and safety of, uh, uh, as experienced by, by service users, the, the population as a whole within the ICS geography, um, and how well that's understood by within the ICS and the contribution of the ICS to, to quality and safety within, within, the, within the patch. Um, so that, that's a, a, a really, really high level overview of, of the sort of the focus of our um, of our assessment or the way it might be structured, if you like. But obviously, this is, there'll be a lot of supporting uh, detail underneath that in terms of uh, additional um, sort of questions that would be would, would, would be probed and, and all of the evidence that would need to be uh, developed um, un sitting underneath that. But what we want to do, broadly speaking, is, is test uh, this part of our initial thinking with with this group and and check if people feel that we're on the right track. Um, obviously, as we as we go along, we'll be seeking more input on the on the detail of our approach as well. Um, next slide, thanks. That might be the uh, that might be the end of the the first part of the presentation. So we've got another slide, I think, after this with some of the sort of the key issues that we. Uh, uh, we, we're aware of that we'll need to consider as we uh, do the do the work, but just want to pause here to take any initial questions for uh, for clarification if people have have any. Hi Matt, there's a there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if you've seen those, but we've got one from Benjamin Vickers who asks if we've got an idea of what the process to obtain the baseline information would involve for local authorities, considering there is no historical legacy relationship. Uh, 
so I think I think that's to be worked through. Uh, if I'm honest, um, I, I I can't answer that question myself. Uh, I, I'm not in, in in the detail of the local authority work myself. Sorry, um, but if you if you think about it with with I mean I think the same issue applies in um, uh, the integrated care system side of things as well. Um, well, so what we'll be looking at doing is is looking at what information is is going to be available at the ICS level um, and working with partners. So uh, uh, NHS England and Improvement will have information that that they're collecting for their for their role in overseeing parts of the you know, uh, of the integrated care system, uh, and other partners will have information. One of the things we we will need to consider, and and as we do with provider regulation. Is is considered w whether we actively gather information ourselves and which type of information we gather. So do we do we ask integrated care system bodies to submit information to us? Uh, do we? Uh, there's a range of information gathering activities we can do in terms of sort of you know you can do survey work, you can do a whole, a whole range of different sort of uh, bespoke information gathering ourselves as well. So it, with that that's really the the, the process we're going to have to go through over the next you know. Uh, year 18 months is developing that that methodology for gathering the, the the evidence to support these assessments and matt can i just add to that because i think it's a really important point and something that we want to think about at an early stage is we know that very often what we focus on in terms of what we measure leads to kind of a focus on that area and the improvements so i think it's really something we need Need to carefully think through is what intelligence do we collect and what what intelligence do we look at that is really going to focus areas on the right things that are going to drive the right um the right areas to have that focus on because i think uh, if we get that right then it will drive it, it has the potential to drive significant improvements across systems um so thoughts about that would be very welcome as well Thanks both. And we've also got a question from Sigrid who asks if there will be a pilot phase for implementation. Yes, yeah, so um, we will certainly be wanting, sorry Matt, I saw you coughing. I don't know if you want me to come in or you want to come in. Um, we, we will certainly be wanting to test out what we're doing and pilot uh, pilot our approach and work with some, um, uh, some ICSs who are keen to work with us over the coming months to make sure that by the time we go live with our um, uh, with our implementation, that we're in a position that we're confident our methodology is going to be delivering uh, what it needs to. So that's absolutely something we'll want to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a couple couple more questions in the chat, and then I know we've got um, Brendan with his hand up as well. So um, if we come to the chat questions first, uh, Bex is asking um, how we'll recognise the additional challenges and complexity for local authorities where they have more than one ICS in their area uh, and also two tiers. Um, will there be benchmarking for the different levels of complexity to foster good practice? So I think an interesting question about where different types of systems overlap with one another. Yeah. And again, if I start and then Matt and Anne and others might want to come in, but I think this is why our plans look at how we're going to start with the I and we statements that um, that uh, TLAP have, have created, because actually we want to look at how do we regulate through the eyes of people who use services? How do we really understand their journeys? And actually, what does it feel like a person using services? Because I think um, several times we've been asked, well, there's lots and lots of different size geographies there's lots of different demographic situations within these ICSs but I think if we go right back to actually what does it mean for a person using services in that area and start from there then that uh, that will help us deal with some of those complexities um it is a complex area and we know that there's different geographies there's different uh, um different footprints um we need to test out what we do at which level as well what do we do at ICS level place level what do we do at uh, neighborhood level even so uh, and how do we understand that so I think that's something that we definitely need to work through and we don't have all of the answers at the moment um how we also look at uh, the the different demographics and the uh, the kind of areas such as you know how do you compare an inner city area with an area that's very rural or areas with higher deprivation is something we're going to have to work through with the, the intelligence that we've got and the uh, the work that we already have done in this area. 
so lots of unknowns at the moment and lots of they're part of the reason for this these type calls is to start hearing your thoughts about what we need to do so matt do you want to come in on on anything around that no or, i think um, i think you yeah. you covered it from my perspective i don't know if any others want to come in no i think i think you've covered it rosie and i think uh benjamin's question about the information the information so we can prepare for the process as part of the co-production and as part of the development benjamin we'll take you through our thinking every step of the way so by the time we start to come to paper-based test and test on site you'll be very very clear about what we're looking at what will what the evidence set looks like the sort of things we want to talk to you about so you should have and of course we will share with you in advance anything that we'll want you to prepare for our arrival so the whole idea of this is to co-produce and be as transparent and as open as possible with yourselves and others so we're very very clear about expectations from the off so i hope that answers your question in that regard and when you said about the timeline of when you would expect inspections to go live, we're thinking sort of the testing in 2022, calendar year 2022, and then obviously more comprehensively in 2023. Would that be fair to say, Matt? That's right. And we should have introduced you, Anne. Anne Ford is our deputy oh, sorry. chief inspector. I... Who? No, it's my fault. Who is is leading on the systems work? Nice to meet you all, and thank you for coming today. Thanks, thanks, everyone. And I think definitely just to just to kind of doubly confirm what Anne was saying. We we might not have all the answers to your questions today, but that's because we're we're keen to co-produce everything for you, with you from the very start. So these are definitely the right questions to be asking. Um, can I come to Brendan next, who's got his hand up? Thanks so much. I realise again this may be one of those uh, early questions, but um, just hearing what you've said so far, I'm just wondering how you think what the thinking is at the moment about the way in which you'll work with NHS England, with Ofsted, around CAMS and SEND and so on, you know, the partner regulators and inspectors, that sort of thing. Yeah, certainly. So. Shall I just, um, again, if I start and then others might want to chip in. So it's really important to us that as regulators, we work very closely together. We know from our local system review work and the re subsequent report beyond barriers that if regulators don't work together, they can become barriers in themselves to integrated care. And we are very, very keen that that doesn't happen. We already have a really good working relationship with Ofsted and I lead a team that works with Ofsted looking at uh, SEND inspections and other parts of um, children's services. So we've got some great, uh, great learning, particularly from that work as to how we can look at people's experiences through health, social care and education in that situation. We're having lots of discussions with NHS England at the moment. It's it's vital to us that actually the sum of the whole between ourselves and NHS England adds up and makes sense at the end of the day. There's no point um, us, uh, us duplicating. We don't want to all be coming to systems who are going to be busy kind of with different requests for data in different ways. Um, that's going to just add to uh, add to the already busy workload. Um, and we want to make sure that we're, we're um, both in our regulatory action enabling systems to get on and and do what they need to across all of the sectors so it's something that we have discussed with nhs england and will continue to do so and make sure that um we work collaboratively to uh, to get to the best outcome so matt yeah. and and you want to add anything to that yes please um if i may rosie uh, the whole idea is to make is not to add to the regulatory burden and I think Rosie's been clear about working very collaboratively with our partners. So we don't, there will be a small degree of overlap, but there won't be any overlap, there won't be duplication. And that when we do come, we add value, we share the information, we share the data, we share our thinking in advance. So we're, we're fairly clear about where we need to focus when we arrive to do the assessment. So I think the whole idea is about support and challenge and secure and improvement and being supportive in that way as the systems mature and move forward. So very much about enhancing performance 
and uh, reducing the burden, which is why we want to do this so collaboratively. Thanks, Anne. I think we might have time for, for a couple more questions before we need to move on to the group discussions. So I know Sarah has asked, um, um, asked us whether our uh, assessments at the ICS level will impact how we assess and inspect and rate uh, providers within that system. So very much about the interrelation between those two levels of regulation. So I think that's um, one of the topics for discussion in some ways, but um, I think the broadly broadly speaking, where we're coming at it is that the the assessment would focus on on the ICS level taken broadly. There'd be a range of assessment activity um, carried out to inform that judgment of the overall ICS. Um, if if things come up in in respect of individual providers, that might prompt some follow up activity with that provider might identify things that, that the provider needs to, to respond to or that we'd pick up with them. But it, it, so it wouldn't be as straightforward as something from an ICS level kind of in some sort of mechanical way affecting a, a, a provider's rating in, in, a, in a very straightforward way. That's not, I think, how we would how we'd see it happening. Um, be more a case of identify things that, that, that need following up if, that, if that's the case. Um, Can I just add to that, Matt, as well? Because I think, you know, I think we, a question that we need to ask with our provider regulation is um, I mean my view is providers can't work as islands anymore they have to they have a duty to work as part of their system and I think we have to question ourselves whether um, providers who don't collaborate with the rest of the system whether we should be still marking those as good because I think um, you know actually the challenges that we're seeing across the health and care system need everyone working collaboratively together um, as much as possible and I guess there is a question as well in terms of um, ICS is how ambitious we should be and I'm being quite provocative here but you know should we rate uh, uh, an ICS good or outstanding if they have half of their social care homes that are, are, are rated inadequate for example um, not that we have that many uh, social care homes rated inadequate but um, or they, they haven't supported their primary care providers or you know we've got mental health services that are meeting people's needs I think um, I think we have to ask ourselves how do we make sure that um, we're ambitious in terms of what the ICSs are trying to deliver here and how do we support that ambition uh, through what we do. Thanks, Rosie. I, I know um, I think Benjamin has his hands up, so we'll come to him in a second. Just to say, if we can't get to all your questions in this part of the, of the session, please bring them into your breakout rooms and we'll definitely take them away to inform our, our future thinking. But Benjamin, do you want to ask a, a last question before we move on? Yeah, thank you. Um, so it was just around, and you might not know the answer, but around the powers that CQC might have over the ICS. So what came to mind then was, there's possibly some opportunity around in I work in community health and we have a significant pressures of people coming out of hospital into community nursing, that type of thing. And there's massive national strategy around care close to home, that kind of agenda. But what we struggle with is getting our acute partners to sort of release money, staff that never sort of follows the traffic. So if within that system, what powers do you have to compel other providers to improve other ones kind of thing? So those type of things, if we see things that are not uh, enabling good care and they're impacting on care that people are getting, then that's the type of thing we will call out in our, our reports and the type of thing we will comment on. Um, we are looking at what escalation will look like um, through this. We're not likely to have enforcement powers, but we will be looking at other routes of escalation if we don't think things are happening. And I think we want to very much live by the, you know, why are ICSs set up? Um, what are the purposes of ICSs? You know, it's, it's about looking at earlier intervention. It's about prevention. It's about looking at wider determinants of health. It's about meeting those challenges and getting people really good joined up care. So actually, if we don't see that in a system, then I think that's the type of thing that we will, we will be thinking we need to um, highlight the system. So um, be good, good to hear your thoughts so in these discussions about what we should be looking at. But that's exactly the type of thing I think we need to look at and make sure people get good care. So Anne, over to you. Thanks Rosie. I think one of the questions we'll be asking Benjamin is if you can you be a good provider if you're not a good pro, uh, if you're not a good partner and how that might look. 
So part of being really well led and part of being a good system partner is the collaboration, isn't it? I think the other thing is historically that the way the funding streams are aligned and the way success is measured um, drives behaviour, as Rosie said. So I think part of our role as well nationally will be about bringing out the barriers that systems are facing and being able to say something about we need to align attractors for systems more appropriately. We need to perhaps to change some of the national metrics around that. And we'd be in a position to make a comment about that, wouldn't we? After we've done after we've looked at systems and seen what the challenges are. So I don't think it's worked out. I don't think it's written in tablets of stone yet, but it's certainly something that we're exploring is how we can, you know, use whatever levers are available to us to secure and support improvement. Thanks, Anne. I think we, if we're OK to move on to introducing the discussion questions for breakout rooms. Thanks, Sam. Um, so this is a sort of preliminary to the discussion questions here, this slide. Um, this is obviously a, a, a new big complex piece of work. Um, we just wanted to, although we've been talking at a, at a high level about uh, where the work is up to so far and some of the, the sort of the, the broad direction we're heading in. There are obviously a, a whole range of complications and, and sort of questions, issues that will need to be worked through as we do this work. Some of those have come up already in different ways in some of the questions that people are asking. Um, just to put it put it down on, on paper, if you like, um, this is some of the, the key issues that we're most most aware of or are most in the front of our mind that we'll need to to focus on as we as we develop the methodology then the assessment framework for for these assessments um, as we go on. There are others, of course, but these are some of the key ones um, around service user voice at system level, how we collect it and how we how that informs our overall judgment of of the uh, quality and, and collaboration leadership of the system and, and more generally other sources of evidence, that whole point around evidence gathering um, and, and all the different ranges of evidence that will be available at ICS level around inequalities of, of access and, and population health. It, 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 all, I mean, this is a new level of assessment, obviously, so there'll be new sources of, source, sources of evidence that will need to be gathered um, at that level. Um, the point about variation among ICSs, um, which is, has come up, I think, in, 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 the, in the chat as well, that's something we're, we're very aware of. We need to work through um, and, and that really plays out in the, in the detail of, of how we use specific sources of evidence and then how that all adds, adds up to a judgment, how we take account of variation in scale and levels of development. These are a new, new going to be new bodies, of course, as, as, as well as being a new assessment approach. So we're going to have to take that into account in our baselining and as we go through. Um, talked about impact and follow up, um, the sort of levers that are available and the focus on driving improvement. Talk about the focus between um, of the relationship between provider, local authority, ICS assessments, how all that adds up to overall judgments and how things play back down in terms of follow up, follow up in individual providers. So plenty to be worked through in there in terms of the specific of how that how that works. Um, role of provider collaboratives is, is an interesting one. How how we how provider collaboratives um, should be played into our assessments at ICS level, but equally the um, the provider level is as, as well and what what um, the, the performance of a lead provider means um, for 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 that organization all of that sort of stuff uh, duplication regulatory burden and and I think another one that um, in terms of actually sources of evidence point is is the question of kind of the level of detail that we should report on within within an ICS you know we can do something at the overall ICS level but I think we're we're, we're interested in exploring is is what is a useful level of detail of reporting within an ICS? Is, are there things that we can do at sort of neighbourhood or place level within an ICS that would be helpful in terms of talking about the quality of care within ICS, within places within an ICS? And, and what would, if we're able to do that, what would that mean for our judgment of the overall whole? So plenty to be worked through. I'm sure there's, well, there are certainly other, other things that we will need to be looking at, um, but that's just a bit of a prompt for discussion and, and some, some ideas for, for things to, to consider and, and key things that we're aware of. We've got a couple of really uh, high level discussion questions on the next 
um, next slide, um, just just as as a as a frame of reference for the for the conversation, really, um, and sort of broadly, what what sort of input we're 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 particularly interested in at the moment. So, in general, kind of what are the key things we need to consider when looking at quality and systems? We've we've kind of talked about a few of them already, um, but there's you know there's a pl there's plenty of detail we can get into around under those broad headings. Um, and other things that we need to make sure we don't miss. So really interested in your thoughts about what should be, we be um, looking at, what are the priorities, what are the, the big things we need to make sure we don't miss in terms of quality and systems, and and a general question around your your overall reflections on, on our thinking so far. So I think that's, um, hopefully that's, a, that's a, a bit of a steer for the, for the discussion, and we'll, we'll uh, hand over to, to Sam. Uh, well, hopefully um, um, our colleague Steph is on on hand to start moving us across into breakout rooms. So Steph, sure. I think people should just automatically start going over in a sec. Yeah, yeah, it should take about 10 seconds. Um, so yeah, so I will be hanging back for any sort of tech issues. So hopefully by some sort of team's magic, you should be arriving in your uh, breakout rooms. It's automatically, does it? <laughs> Yeah, it's automatic, Joan. <laughs> 